So I know from my personal experience and also from talking to many people over the years that when you start studying the ego, there usually comes a point where you feel confused and you often feel overwhelmed because you're beginning to understand what the ego is, what the ego does. But it hits you that the ego is very subtle and therefore it can be very difficult to see through the illusions of the ego. And this is actually a good thing. It's actually a very necessary phase because you cannot overcome the ego without going through this stage of what we can call magnificent confusion. Now, I know that it'll seem unpleasant for many people. It certainly did for me. Um, but it's actually a magnificent state of mind. And once you understand what I'm going to talk about in, in this um, talk, you will begin to see why. And so let's begin by talking about the ego and confusion, or rather the ego and certainty. So what I have explained before is that there came a point where we made the decision to go into this state of mind, this state of consciousness that's based on the illusion of separation. And I've said also that when we did this, we did have a certain sense that we had lost something. We weren't quite conscious of what we had lost, but we had a sense that we had lost something. And <clears throat> that means that suddenly we shifted from what we might call a positive approach to life to a deficit approach. You see, what I have said is that before we go into separation, we see ourselves as connected beings. We are connected to something outside our minds, which means we have a certain frame of reference for evaluating everything. And uh, this means that, as I've talked about in one of my breakthrough videos, when you see yourself as a connected being, when you realize that you are on this path of raising your consciousness, you can't really go wrong. You can't really make any grave mistakes. Because anything that happens is an opportunity to learn, to look at yourself, to expand your consciousness. But when you go into separation, you can't do this. And now all of a sudden, you are thinking in terms of the dualistic polarities, right and wrong, good and bad, mistake and not mistake. And this means that all of a sudden, the conscious you shifts from feeling that everything was basically okay, or certainly I am okay because I can experiment, I can learn. Now it feels like I'm at risk because I could be wrong. What if I did something really wrong? And as I've explained in my Avatar series, many of us who came to Earth as Avatars, we were exposed by the fallen beings to these situations where it seemed like we had done something epically wrong, made some really bad mistake. And so this is an unbearable situation for us. And that's why we create the ego, or certainly these separate selves that are called ego, and they are created to make us feel like we are never really wrong. So what this means is that when you are still seeing yourself as a connected being, you don't know everything, and you realize you don't know everything. Right? Because you're connected. You know there's something beyond you, well, however you see it. But you notice know something beyond your own mind. And this is your frame of reference. This is the source that can help you grow and get better. Right? So you're always focused on how can I get better? How can I prove myself? It's like uh, an, an image here is look at a little child that's just at that age where it's starting to walk. Right? So it's standing there holding on to a chair, looking like, do I dare to do this or not? And suddenly it takes a step and it falls down. And what does it do when it falls down? Well, it just laughs and it gets up again. And now it's standing there a little bit longer, walking back and forth, and then it takes another step. 
And even though it falls down again, it just laughs and gets up again. And this is what we do when we are connected beings. And that's one reason why Jesus said, unless you become as little children, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom. Because we're experimenting and we're learning from everything. Fall down, we just laugh, get up again. But once you go into separation, you can't do that because now something epic has happened in your consciousness. You could make mistakes, bad mistakes. And so the ego is, in a sense, created to compensate for this fear that you could make mistakes and to suppress it. So it seems like you're not making mistakes, right? So when you're connected, you, you have, in a sense, you don't know everything, so there is a certain confusion there, right? When you do something, you're experimenting. You, you don't know for sure how things are going to turn out, but you're just willing to experiment. So in a sense, you could say when you're connected, there's a certain confusion. When you go into separation, in order to overcome this fear of making a mistake, you create the ego, and the ego always has certainty. The ego cannot allow itself to be uncertain, to be confused. So the ego always knows what's right. And how does it know what's right? Because the ego is defining what's right by using the duality consciousness and the black and white thinking. This is absolutely right. This is absolutely wrong. And because the ego is the one who defines it, your ego, when you are really blinded by it, can define every situation so that it seems like you were not really wrong. In fact, you were right. And so when you look at the people who are what we would call the, the most ego-centered, the most blinded by their egos, they're always sure they're right. I mean, just look at some of these people that are out there right now in the world. And um, they always think they're right. They're sure they're right. They cannot be wrong. Right? So this is what you, you can come to realize, that the ego always has certainty. And in order to overcome being blinded by the ego's illusions, you have to be willing to question that certainty and therefore go through a period where you will feel confused. Now, you know, there, there are people who can come to a point where intellectually they understand the ego, but they're not willing to really become confused. So, what do they do? They actually allow their egos to take over their study of the ego. In other words, the ego defines the quest these people have to follow, or the path these people have to follow to overcome the ego. And the effect of that is what? It is, of course, they don't overcome the ego. They may overcome certain elements of the ego. Because what have I said? The ego is not this one unified amorphous entity. It's made up of all of these subconscious selves. And the ego is willing to sacrifice some of these selves in order to preserve itself. Now, the ego is really also a self, but there is a, a certain original self you created when you went into separation, and that will be the last one, probably, that you give up. Uh, and so, um, that's the one that will seek to preserve itself, and it's in doing so, it's willing to sacrifice the others. That's why you can see some people who say that um, they have studied the ego, and they came to the point where they saw the ego, they understood what the ego is about, and they overcame it, and now they're ego-free. There are also people that have had this dramatic uh, experience of ego death, they call it, and now they think they are ego-free. And I'm not doubting that people can have that experience. But what I am saying is that these, this were just a couple of separate selves that they experienced the death of, and they experienced overcoming, maybe more than two, but there's still an element of the ego left. Why? Well, are you in a physical body on planet Earth? If so, you have elements of the ego left, and it's wise to realize that and keep looking for it. Okay, so back to the ego certainty. 
how does the ego create certainty? Well, as I said, it uses the duality consciousness. In the duality consciousness, there are always two polarities, two extremes. So, the ego says, this polarity is right, the opposite polarity is wrong. So as long as you are in this polarity, you believe in this belief system, this religion, uh, have this view of the world, you are right. You can't be wrong. And these other people who don't agree with you or have the others, they're just wrong. And so in black and white thinking, you can always define a sharp contrast between right and wrong, and therefore the ego is never confused. And this, as I said, is what you see in the most ego-centered, narcissistic uh, people. And it's actually, uh, in a sense, you, could, you have this old saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And these are the good intentions that are defined by black and white thinking. It leads to all kinds of atrocities. You can see it right now in the world. You can see it in history. So, um, so this is one way the ego creates this certainty. You know, you are absolutely right because you have this standpoint. This is black and white thinking. But the other way, interestingly, which you might not think about at first, the other way that the ego create, can create certainty is what I talked about in a previous uh, talk about gray thinking. And Gray thinking is that, well, let's take one example, right? You have, um, in philosophy, you have people who have uh, certainty because they are sure this is the way it is. Religious people, for example, often have this certainty their religion is the only true one and they know for sure that God exists the way their religion defines God. That God, the angry man up there in the sky, really does exist, they're sure. Then you have the opposite uh, position to that, which is agnosticism, which says, we can't know. We can't know for sure. And so you have some agnostics that are saying that we can't know. But the reality is that their ego is using this to create a certainty, because they are certain that we can't know. And therefore, they don't need to discern. Right? So, this is the effect of the ego. You know, you have some people, as I said, they're absolutely sure that they're right and they're never wrong. Then you have some people who maybe in past lives, maybe in this life, have been beaten down by life, by circumstances in life. And they have gone into this gray thinking and saying, oh, I just can't know. I don't know what's right. Um, I have to believe what the authorities tell me to believe, or I have to not really believe anything. And you might think that these people are confused because compared to the black and white thinkers, they seem to not really know what's right and wrong. But in a certain way, they have allowed their egos, another aspect of the ego, another separate self, to make them feel they have certainty in not knowing. And so what is the real problem here is this. These people, both of them, are in separation. That means they're not connected to what I have called the one mind. They're not connected to their higher selves, to their spiritual teachers in the ascended realm. And here is the real crucial thing. I know this can be tricky to understand. It took me a while to, to grasp this. You see, in the dualistic thinking, there's always the claim that this is right, this is wrong. And I remember myself, when I first started uh, grasping, or, you know, really thinking about duality and dualistic thinking, I was confused because I thought, but there must be something that's right. There, there must be something that, it can't be that it's all just wrong. But you see, in dualistic thinking, it is all out of touch with the one mind. It, it, it's even meaningless to say it's all wrong. But it is just out of touch with the reality of the one mind, the reality that all life is one, that all forms came from the same source. And therefore, behind every form is the one mind. 
That's the underlying reality. And that is what the duality consciousness, the ego, the separate selves, cannot fathom. They will never fathom it. So look at it this way. What the ego has created by using the duality consciousness is a false certainty, an impression, a mental image of certainty. But there is actually a real certainty, but you can only achieve that certainty through the one mind. And when you are a connected being, you have access to at least an aspect of the one mind. But what we need to grasp, and this is again tricky, because the ego wants everything to be absolute. So when the ego hears this concept of the one mind, it wants to project, yes, this is the absolute truth. If you have experienced even a glimpse of the one mind, this is the absolute truth. And that's why you can see, you know, basically when you experience the one mind, it's what people have throughout the ages called a mystical or intuitive experience. And you can see people that call themselves mystics. And they have had, and I'm sure they've had genuine mystical experiences. But some of them still present themselves as, I'm a Christian mystic, I'm a Sufi mystic, I'm a Hindu mystic. Because they believe that their mystical experience validated the Christian doctrines, the doctrines of the Christian church, or the Hindu church, or the Muslim faith, or whatever. And you see, this is what we have to realize. You are at a certain level of consciousness. Whatever level of consciousness, I've talked about 144 levels. At your level of consciousness, whatever the, even if it's the lowest level possible on earth, you have access to the Christ mind, but not the fullness of the Christ mind. You have access to the Christ mind, which can show you the illusion that's keeping you trapped at your present level of consciousness and the higher truth that will take you up to the next level. It's a genuine experience of the one mind, but it is not the fullness of the one mind. And that is what you have to realize, that you can, no matter what level of consciousness you are at, you can have a genuine experience of the one mind, and it will show you an illusion. And in order to show you that something is an illusion, I have to show you something that's a higher understanding. But that higher understanding you can see at your present level is not the ultimate truth. It's not the fullness of the one mind. There is another level that takes you up to the next level. Say you're at the 24th level. You can have a genuine mystical experience of the one mind. Shows you the illusion at the 24th level, shows you the higher reality so you can go up to the 25th level. But at the 25th level, you are still way away from the 144th level. You are still in a, a level of separation. And if you don't grasp that what you see here is not the fullness of the one mind, your ego will use this experience to say, now you have the absolute truth. And therefore you don't need to look for me anymore. Because you're guaranteed to be saved if you follow this Christian religion, or if you think you have experienced ego death, or whatever. So the ego will use a genuine mystical experience to give you a, another type of false certainty that says, you don't have to go further. Now that you've had this experience that was so real, you don't have to look for me anymore, just ignore the ego. You, are, you don't need to look for the ego. That's what the ego will do. And that's why we have to realize the one mind can give us a genuine experience which can serve as a frame of reference for overcoming an aspect of the ego, the aspect of the ego that corresponds to a particular level of consciousness. But this is not the fullness of the Christ consciousness. It doesn't mean we have certainly uh, suddenly become the Christ or the Buddha or ego-free or uh, we are in a non-dual state of awareness. We've just taken a step up. And we need to continue to look for the next illusion, the next experience of the one mind, so we can take the next step. And we continue to do this as long as we're in embodiment. But the ego, as I said, it will try to make it so that the last step you have taken, 
becomes the last step you will ever take. And in order to avoid that, we have to be willing to question the ego's certainty and go into the state of magnificent confusion. And it's magnificent because the ego will always project it knows everything. And only if the conscious you is willing to acknowledge, I don't know everything, and my ego doesn't know everything, only then can the conscious you start the genuine inner path of overcoming the ego. Because, look at it this way, you cannot overcome the ego on your own. It cannot be done. There are all kinds of people who think it can be done. There are even people who claim to be spiritual teachers who think it can be done. They think you can use the rational linear mind to expose the ego and overcome the ego. You can use the rational mind to overcome aspects of the ego, but you can't use the rational mind to overcome the ego completely. Because the only way to overcome the ego, the duality consciousness, is the one mind. The one mind is the only alternative to the duality consciousness, to the consciousness of separation, to the ego illusions. But we can only experience the one mind, as I said, in increments. And that's why it's an ongoing process as long as we're in embodiment. Basically, you can say, while you are still completely trapped by your ego, you will most likely have certainty, a certain sense of certainty. There may be some questions you have. I mean, if, if, you, if you want to put it really in black and white terms, uh, people who are completely trapped by the egos, they are not open to the spiritual path. So, in order to become open to the spiritual path, you have to have some uncertainty, some questions that haven't been answered. And therefore, you are willing to consider this. But you probably still have many elements of the ego certainty that you carry with you. I can look back at myself. I, I hear about the spiritual path when I'm 18 years old. And it was a revolutionary shift for me. I mean, within Within one weekend where I read the book by pa Paramahansa Yogananda, Autobiography of a Yogi, my entire worldview, it, it was revolutionized. You know? And you could say, I had an awakening experience, awakening experience when I was 18. And in a certain sense, I did, yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I was fully awakened when I was 18 years old, let me tell you that. And it would be extremely naive to think so. I thought so for a while, but eventually <laughs> reality caught up with me. <laughs> and um, so, so what I'm saying here is that, you know, the only way out of the ego's illusions is the one mind. And it's not a matter of theorizing about the one mind. We have to experience it. And you may say, well, what if I haven't had this experience? And I would say, well, if you're open to these teachings, you have. Maybe you're not consciously aware of it. Maybe you haven't fully identified what it was. But you have had these experiences where you experienced something that was more real than what's going on in your own mind, all that reasoning uh, argumentation of the ego. Because the ego can only argue based on a duality consciousness. So you have experienced there as an alternative, so you wouldn't even be open to this. So it's just a matter of becoming more aware of it, more clear of that, that you have had these experiences, so you begin to have more and more of them, begin to trust them more and more. But what I want to get back to is this. You can't escape the ego by using the ego. Einstein said you can't solve a problem with the same state of consciousness created the problem. And if the problem is the ego, the ego cannot overcome itself. It never will be able to because it doesn't have self-awareness as the conscious you has. The conscious you can because it has self-awareness. The ego can't step outside itself, look at itself and say, gosh, you're stupid, man. It can't do that. But the conscious you can step outside of the ego, at least the separate self, and look at the self and say, gosh, you're stupid self. I don't want you anymore in my life. I don't want to react this way. So this is what the conscious you can do when it's willing to be confused, when it's willing to ask questions.
So if the conscious you clings to the certainty of the ego, you can't start the path of becoming free from the ego. It just can't be done. Because the ego will pull you into. You don't need to look at the ego because if you're declared Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you're guaranteed to be saved. So why do you need to study ego? Right? So, so it's only through the Christ mind. And this is where we come to this. You know, it's, it's an, again an enigma. It's, it's a catch-22 on the spiritual path. Because you can hear me say this. Only through the one mind can you overcome the ego. But the ego is immediately going to say, okay, so what's the one mind? Define it. Give me a definition of the one mind so I can see if I live up to it or not, if I uh, follow that or not. But you see, as I said, you cannot define the one mind because there's different levels of it up through the 144 levels of consciousness. And it doesn't do any good if somebody, some enlightened master, was to explain to you what the Christ consciousness, uh, the Christ truth is, or the one truth is at the 144th level, if you are at the 64th level. It doesn't do you any good because you can't grasp it. So what you can grasp if you are at the 64th level is the, the, one expression of the, the expression of the one mind that takes you to the 65th level. That you can grasp. But the ego will say, oh no, if this is the true teaching about the ego, it should be the absolute truth. And therefore, if it doesn't have the absolute truth, it's not a true teaching. You see? Ego always tries to come up with something that is black and white. and um, Or gray, for that matter. So. You have experienced the one mind. And by becoming consciously aware that the core of your lower being is the conscious you, and that the conscious you isn't the outer mind, but has the ability to step outside the outer mind, you will begin to have more of these experiences. You begin to become more aware of the experiences you've already had. And that is what allows you to start this path, to engage in the real path where you step by step use the one mind, receive an insight from the one mind that becomes your frame of reference for looking at your current delusion, identifying it as a separate self. It's not real. And as I said, I've said before, you know, a separate self usually defines a problem and it projects that you have to do something about the problem. But when you, you see, and here's again this, the ego will say, okay, this guy is talking about the one mind. Right. So here's a problem. You have been exposed to that problem all of your life. For example, you've been arguing with this other person all of your life. Your mother, your father, your brother, sister, whatever. You've been arguing with this person all of your life. So the one mind should be able to give you the ultimate argument that could put that person in its place and prove them wrong. This is what the ego will say. But what the one mind will do is it will say, you don't have to keep arguing with this person for the rest of your life. You don't have to be right. You don't have to prove them wrong before you can be free of this entire reactionary pattern, this subconscious self. You can simply look at it, identify it as a self, and identify that the entire problem that the self is defining is unreal. Because it's defined based on the consciousness of separation and duality. It seems like it's epically important to solve the problem. But it's not. It doesn't matter. You take my last episode where I talk about I had this conflict with my supervisor in my second spiritual movement. And while I was in this state of mind I was in, it seemed epically important to resolve this issue and prove that I was right. But when I stepped outside of that and contacted the one mind, it just fell away. It was not important anymore. I actually realized it was much more important to be free of this reaction. So I didn't have to go through the rest of my life being in conflict with this person and that person and the next person. Because this pattern made sure that I was always in conflict with somebody. Because there was always some problem that I saw that I had to correct and do something about. 
And it ate up my energy, my time, my attention. And I came to a point where I saw, but it doesn't matter. And I literally saw, do I want to be right among men? Or do I want to be right with my higher self, with the one mind, with the ascended masters? There's a quote by Jesus where he says, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. In other words, what are all these outer arguments and fights? What does it really matter to you? Follow the one mind into higher and higher levels of consciousness. And that's really the choice we are making at every step of the path. The conscious you is making that choice. Do I want to come one step higher or do you want to stay in thinking I have to solve this problem? This is what we might call a life decision, as opposed to a death decision where we decide, oh, I want to stay in this year. I haven't had enough of this. I, I want to prove this person wrong. I want to prove myself right. And only when I have proven myself ultimately right will I let go of it. But you see, you will never be ultimately right because the ego is using your duality consciousness may claim that there is an absolute right, but there's always going to be an opposite polarity. So the ego, it, it's, it claims that it can solve a problem and come to some ultimate solution, but it's never going to get there because there's always going to be something, some opposite polarity. It's a never-ending quest, never-ending. It's like quicksand. The more you move, the deeper you sink. The more you try to prove somebody else wrong, prove yourself right, the deeper you sink into the quicksand. And that's what the ego wants, because as long as you're sinking, it knows it's surviving. It doesn't want you to simply say, I'm just letting go of this. I'm just letting go. I don't want to be in this reactionary pattern. I don't want to play these games. It's enough. So that is what the ego is trying to prevent, that the conscious you makes this life decision. And, um, you know, in a sense we can say that, and I, I have said this before, that um, when you are at the 48th level of consciousness and above, where you see yourself as a connected being, you are making real decisions. The conscious you actually has some freedom of will and it's making real decisions. You know, do I want to? Look for the illusion. Do I want to look for the higher understanding? Uh, do I want to come closer to wonders? Or, and, uh, but when you go below, the conscious you is essentially saying, I don't want to make decisions anymore. And it's doing this because, as I said, you go below the 48th level of consciousness, you feel you've lost something, and you feel now you can suddenly make mistakes. And look at this uh, planet. Just look at the planet how many situations there are where it seems like people are making these epic mistakes. And, you know, in past lifetimes, we have all been exposed to this, as I talk about in the Avatar videos, the fallen beings have deliberately attacked us, tried to manipulate us into situations where it seemed like we had to make a decision. There was no good decision to make. We were damned if we do and damned if we don't. Whatever the outcome was, it was disastrous. And they have tried to make us feel that we were wrong for even being here, for coming to Earth as avatars, but even being here, we're wrong. And this is, of course, uh, unbearable for the conscious you. So the conscious you says, after it's re received this initial trauma, uh, cosmic burst trauma, as we can call it, uh, it says, I never want to experience this again. I never want to experience this again. And so it says, it creates this separate self and says, your job is to make sure I never experience that again, being so wrong. And I will, therefore the ego says, yes, but you know, when I use the duality consciousness, I can make it appear that you are never wrong because there's always somebody else who's wrong. In duality, there is always deniability. So the ego takes on this role, you will never be wrong, and it can do this through black and white thinking, you can do it through gray thinking. Because if you are an agnostic, you can't really know what's true and not true, so how can you ever be really wrong? And in black and white thinking, there's always an untruth, and if you're on the side of truth, you can never be wrong. 
So this is the certainty of the ego. But the certainty of the ego is always based on denial. Because you are denying that there's something else that's right. You are denying that you could be wrong. You are denying that there's a need to doubt. You are denying that there's a need to look at yourself and question yourself. So we could say that when the conscious you decides that it doesn't want to make decisions anymore, obviously you are still in physical embodiment, you are still in life situations, and you are required to make decisions. I mean, you can't survive without making decisions. So what the conscious you basically says, it goes into hibernation, uh, like a bear that crawls into a cave in the fall. And, but since you are not actually in a cave, somebody has to make decisions. And if the conscious you won't, then the ego starts making decisions. But here's the important point. The ego cannot make decisions. The conscious you can make a decision, as I said, it can make a life decision, I want to grow, or a death decision, I don't want to grow. The ego can only make death decisions in the sense that the ego doesn't have self-awareness, so it can't make an actual decision. It's making a selection between the options that the ego can see. But what have I said? The ego is born out of the duality consciousness. The ego cannot fathom, it cannot experience the one mind. Therefore, it doesn't see the one mind as a solution. The ego sees only the duality consciousness as solutions. So here's a situation. How do you deal with that situation? Well, the ego can only deal with it based on the duality consciousness. What is the result of this? When you make a decision, let's call it, or selection based on a duality consciousness, what happens? You go deeper into the duality consciousness because you're reacting. You're using the duality consciousness to react to one polarity that's also defined by the duality consciousness. So the duality consciousness is reacting to the duality consciousness, and you get more and more involved with duality. You sink deeper into the quicksand. It's like this old saying, if you try to catch the greased pig, you end up covered in mud and you become more and more covered in mud. So we can say that, <clears throat> let's say you have a, a maze, a labyrinth, but it's underground. It's, it's really a mine that has all of these branches that goes off. So at the 48th level, you are standing right at the entrance to this mine, and you are seeing there's a world outside the mine. But now you take a decision that brings you into the mind. You are literally stepping over the line. And now you are looking at things from inside the mind, but you can still see the opening. And you can still see there's a sky, there's trees. Uh, but now you are, you are saying, I don't want to react here, so you're allowing the ego to react. That means now you take another step into the mind. And all of a sudden, there's a situation you have to react to, and the ego can only react based on duality, so it takes you off in another direction. A lot of the ego's decisions are avoidance decisions. Here's a problem. There's some other person, for example, who's attacking you, like the fallen beings are attacking you. You want to get away from that attack. So you go deeper. You go off to the side, into the mind, uh, in, in the mind. So. All of a sudden, now you can't see directly out the door because you're off to the side. So you're only seeing that there is light, but you still see there's light coming uh, through the door. But now another situation comes up, the ego reacts, you take another step to another side, and sooner or later, you have gone so far into the mind that you can't see the light coming from the door. There's still some light, you know, because even if you can't see the light, there's still some light. But it becomes more and more difficult to tell what's right and wrong. And if you keep going long enough, you get so far into the mind, now you can't see the light from the door. You only see what's in the mind. And it's not that it's total darkness, uh, because there is the duality consciousness that says, this is the light, this is right, this is the truth. And so you might follow that, but it still leads you deeper into the labyrinth. 
further and further away from the door, which is the one mind, the light of the one mind. And so, you know, this is what the ego does, and the ego will never stop this process because it can't. It can only keep going here, there, oh, avoid this, oh, that led to this consequence, now I'm going to avoid that consequence, and it just keeps going back and forth like this. You get further and further into the maze. And the only way out is that the conscious you realizes that this mental image projected by the ego that's based on duality, that it's all a lie, it's all an illusion, and it will only lead you to more and more suffering, more and more problems, more and more conflict. And therefore you reach for the one mind. And as I said, no matter how deeply you have gone into that labyrinth, the one mind will still find you and give you a frame of reference that can help you take a step closer to the exit. And that's the real spiritual path, the inner path. But it requires that the conscious you awakens from its hibernation and says, I'm willing to make decisions again. And it's, you see, it's a little tricky to grasp this. Because I remember in the beginning I was thinking, well, I understand this. I have to be willing to make decisions. I have to be willing to uh, make these uh, distinctions, to have this discernment between what's right and wrong. Because I still was thinking in terms of right and wrong. So I was thinking, well, I have to use this. I knew about the Center Masters at the time. I have to use the Center Master teachings to determine what's right and wrong. And it's not that that's an invalid approach. It can stimulate the process. But you still can't do it with the intellectual reasoning mind. You can do something. But in the end, the only thing that really helped me uh, even start the path was that I had these experiences, intuitive experiences, where something just, I experienced something within myself that was not based on argumentation. It was just an experience. You know, it's like, you know, if you are uh, in a mine, in a deep mine where it's total blackness, if somebody turns on a flashlight for a second, you have seen that there is light, there's an alternative to the darkness, and you can't unsee it. It may be that the flashlight's turned off again, so now you're back in darkness, but you still know there was something. And that's what pulls you, wherever you are at. If you seek these experiences, and quite frankly, you don't have to do this alone. This is what's important to understand. Now, think about it this way, right? What I have explained, if you take my video about how the world was created, it has some really important teachings in it that can also help you uh, escape the ego. So it explains that we are actually created to be co-creators. Meaning, we know we are not creating alone. We are not separate beings. We are not isolated beings. We are co-creating along with the beings who are at the higher level of, that's right above ours, the Ascended Masters, and all the way up to the Creator. So this is, this is co-creation. We are not created as separate beings that are alone, that are isolated. We chose to go into the illusion of separation. And in the illusion of separation, all that has happened is we don't see that we are connected anymore. But we still are. And that means that, you know, in a sense you can say, when you are going into separation, when you are allowing the ego to react for you, and you therefore are going back and forth with the duality consciousness deeper and deeper into the maze, you are in a sense saying, you're not saying this consciously, but in essence the consciousness you are saying, I want to experience what it's like to go deeper into separation. Therefore, higher self, ascended masters, don't bother me. Just leave me alone here. I'm, I'm following my own path. I'm doing my own thing. And of course, free will is the ultimate law. Your higher self, the Ascended Masters, must say, okay, uh, go ahead. But we are actually here when you uh, want to come back. We are here for you because we're not judging you. We're not the anger and judgmental God in the sky who wants to punish you because you disobeyed us. You have a free will right to explore the separation. 
right? So when you become aware that you had enough of separation and you want to go back to oneness, you don't have to walk the path back to oneness alone. Your higher self, the Ascended Masters, will be willing to help you. The One Mind will be there for you to give you that alternative. The trick is, you as the conscious you, you have to be willing to make these decisions to continually reach for the One Mind and to continually be willing to doubt the certainty you get from the ego. You have to be willing to go into this magnificent confusion. Because the ego will use anything, this is what I've been trying to say now several times, whatever spiritual teaching, psychological teaching you find, the ego will try to use it to sabotage your progress on the inner path to higher levels of consciousness, because it wants to stay alive. So it will, it will say that, oh, you don't have to make decisions anymore. Now you have made the decision. You have found the spiritual path, you have accepted the spiritual path, you have joined the spiritual movement, you have found these high teachings, you have found this spiritual practice. So just keep studying the teaching, listening to the guru, practicing the practice, then you will one day be ego-free. You don't need to look at the ego anymore, because I can take over now. I can run your spiritual path for you. I can interpret your spiritual teachings for you. I can interpret what the guru says. I can even do the spiritual practice for you by setting up this program that you have to follow. So the ego will try to take over your spiritual path. And, and I went into a period like this myself, and I've seen many other people do it. You know, we find a spiritual teaching, we grew up, as I said, in an unspiritual society, we find a spiritual teaching, we're all excited. But we're not, the conscious you, it's not quite ready to make these decisions, to continually look at ourselves, look at our state of mind. So it allows the ego to take over. And the ego says, oh yes, you just have to meditate so many hours a day and take these courses, and take more and more courses, more expensive courses, or decree for an hour a day, no, two hours a day, no, three hours a day. Then you'll make it. And this is what, uh, you know, it's okay. You know, it's okay that we do this for a time. Because if we have a genuine spiritual practice and teaching, it can still bring us forward. But we are not really going to engage in the inner path until the conscious you becomes aware of this dynamic and becomes willing to continually observe yourself, look at your reactions, and see where is this actually coming from ego? Is this really coming from the one mind, or is it coming from the separate mind? And, you know, I know that that saying this can still make you feel overwhelmed, can still make you feel confused, because how do you know what's coming from the one mind? And again, the ego is right there saying, but you need to have certainty. How can you follow a path if you don't know, if you don't have this absolute truth or a clear definition of the path? But as I've been trying to say, there, <laughs> there is no clear outer definition that can be given for the outer mind. At every level, there is a certain illusion you have to come to see through. And the ego will never see through the illusion. Only the conscious you can do it. But it can only do it if you reach for the one mind. And if you then realize, yes, I saw through an illusion. That took me up to a higher level. But there are still other levels. So in a sense, you can say that, uh, in the beginning at least, I remember this myself. In the beginning, it felt like going onto this inner path was a loss, because what, what, what did I feel like I was losing? I felt I was losing the certainty of the ego. Because, as I said, I found a spiritual path when I was 18. For the first several years, I was basically allowing my ego to run my path and define what I should do and not do. And it gave me, especially in my second spiritual movement, it gave me a sense of certainty. And when I realized what the path really was about, about the inner path and resolving psychology, it felt like I lost that certainty. And now I was in confusion and it felt unpleasant. Because how do I know what's what here? How do I know whether this comes from the ego or whether this comes from the one mind? In the beginning, you, you can't really tell. But I always had enough experiences that I knew, I, I knew there were some experiences that were real. 
because I, I quickly realized that sometimes you have an experience and you just know it's real. Other times you're in the mind and the mind is arguing back and forth. And I also came to realize that I can have an experience and the experience feels real while I'm having it, but then once I'm out of it, the outer mind starts arguing back and forth of what it means, or how to interpret it. But I learned to tell the difference between the experience and the argumentation. And I realized that the argumentation came from the ego. So I became better at you know, identifying the argumentation, not going into it, not allowing my ego to drag me into all of this argumentation back and forth. And it was a process, and it took time, and it will take time for you as well. But it has its own reward, because every time you overcome one of these illusions, you feel more free, you feel more whole, you feel healed, rather than always having this division in your psychology. So uh, <clears throat> I hope, I, I really hope you can grasp this, you know, the difference between the inner path and the outer path and how rewarding it is once you log into the inner path and you follow that. Because that's really, well, it's the only path that's going to lead you beyond the ego. Because the outer path will just lead you deeper and deeper into the maze. And that's why you see some people who don't grasp the inner path. And I have seen people found a spiritual movement. They became really enthusiastic. They did everything right for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But eventually there came a point where they couldn't maintain the illusion anymore. And they became very disappointed, very angry. They felt they had been fooled. The, ego, the guru was a false guru and all of this stuff. And then they completely switched and, and left all spirituality behind. And I think that's really a pity because these people had no doubt uh, defined in their own life plans that they wanted to find the spiritual path, the real spiritual path. And that's why they were willing to put forth this effort. So it's really a pity if, it, if they flip to the opposite extreme. Um, there are also those, as I said, who can be in the same spiritual movement for decades and they think they're doing the right thing and they think that one day they are sure to make it, but they haven't engaged in the inner path. And that's, of course, also a pity because they also have to find in their divine plans that they want to find the inner path and I want to make real progress towards higher states of consciousness. So I hope this has helped you see what it actually takes and see that difference. The outer path, the ego gives you certainty. The inner path, there's a certain uncertainty. There is confusion, but it is a magnificent confusion. <laughs>